in eight years, no one's ever said, are you certified as a coach? Yeah. But for me, I do it because to become a master certified coach is a challenge. It's hard. It's not, this is not an easy thing, but it makes me get better and better and keep improving. And to me, that supports my commitment to my clients. Yeah. Well, that's very interesting. I know that when, when I started my, uh, when I started coaching years ago, I was doing it just, I was still running my company as CEO, but I was coach. I had several entrepreneurs I was coaching kind of on the side. And, and when I began to prepare for the exit of my company, I knew I wanted to go into some form of coaching or speaking. And I looked into coaching certifications and uh, applied to several of them and, and was ready to start. I picked one. I was ready to start. And ultimately, I, I made the decision to attempt to get my PhD instead, take the same same nice. route. But but I didn't get the PhD. I started and didn't get it. So, But I, I'm with you. Nobody asks about it, but the process of going through it makes you a better coach. In today's ultra competitive business world, being a successful entrepreneur or business owner can be very challenging. Fortunately, contemporary times have blessed us with resources for tackling those challenges and getting us to success more quickly than we could have imagined. Welcome to the root of all success with the real Jason Duncan, a podcast that explores how the world's most powerful entrepreneurs grow incredible companies. This podcast looks at the five keys to unlocking success as an entrepreneur. A successful educator turned entrepreneur, Jason's mission is to use his gifts of teaching and leadership to help others get the results they want out of life. Join Jason every week and learn the keys to grow a truly successful business. Welcome back to another episode of The Root of All Success. I'm the real Jason Duncan. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you can see Hey, I'm in a I'm in a new location. Yes, I'm in a new location. I'm in a hotel in Miramar Beach, Florida. I'm here for the weekend, living the exit lifestyle with my wife. We're visiting some friends. We're having a conference down here. We're doing a gala for a nonprofit that we support, and we're also looking for some short-term rental properties to purchase. So we're being we're we're living the exit lifestyle, just what I coach my clients to do every single day. So I'm here in the hotel room today, recording several episodes of the podcast. Uh, if you're listening to this on any of the podcast players, you wouldn't have known that, but because uh, it wouldn't have been any different for you. But I do want to say thank you to the C-Suite Radio Network for the syndication. We get out on all the podcast players because of what they do. And also thank you to, uh, to Two Market Media. Check those guys out at the number two, marketmedia.com. Uh, check them out. They do a fantastic job of working with people like me to get our content out there to the masses. And they manage uh, my podcast for me by doing all the editing, post-production, and then they push it out there to, to C-suite. Um, I, we're also, as I said, we're on YouTube. You can go to youtube.com slash the real Jason Duncan to watch any of these episodes. And thank you for subscribing. Thank you for leaving me a review. I uh, thoroughly enjoy doing this show. I absolutely, absolutely love it more than I can ever, ever let you know. I just truly, truly enjoy it. Today's guest on the show is Alex Terranova. And uh, he, he and I were introduced through a mutual Mutual friend, guy used to be an assistant for him, who uh, now works with another group of people that I, that, he, that Alex and I have a mutual connection to, and uh, we we were we'll talk about this a little bit in the show, but we were supposed to get on each other's show last summer while I was doing a podcast tour in California, and, and uh, it didn't work out. So we're doing this now, but uh, today's guest, Alex Terranova, is was dubbed the anti excuses coach by Yahoo Finance, and I'm going to ask him about that in the show today. Uh, he's written a book called the called uh, uh, fictional authenticity. It's an interesting book about what authenticity really is and how you become authentic. We're going to talk a little bit about that on the show today too, about how that book came about. He's the uh, host of the Dream Mason podcast, which that podcast is actually on hiatus right now. But he also ho co-hosts the Frequency Shifters show and he co-hosts the Coaching Show podcast. He has, supports wildly successful and powerful people to live lives of purpose and passion and impact. And he believes that success doesn't equal happiness. And often our greatest monetary and professional achievements make messes in the areas that matter most to us. And getting that right is really, really important for him as a coach. And since 2015, he's been working with businesses and individuals and in disciplined long-term engagements and also rigorous short-term projects. He graduated from the University of Southern California. Um, and after graduation, he spent uh, several years in 
the hospitality industry running eight figure businesses. And he had a rude awakening at a family event. You're going to hear about that on the show today. And he walked away from that success in the corporate world and began reading over 300 books on success, on creativity, on leadership, on business. And then he launched his own company, the Dream Mason Incorporated. And since then, he's interviewed and helped over 200 of the world's highest performing, brilliant and successful leaders. He's been featured on NBC, Fox, Yahoo Finance, Disrupt Magazine, Thrive Global, Elephant Journal and over 30 top podcasts, including the University of Adversity, Success Unleashed and the Primal Blueprint. So please join me in welcoming the guest on today's show, Alex Terranova. Well, Alex, welcome to the show, man. I'm glad you're here. Thanks for having me. Well, you know, it's we've got quite a story about how we've tried <laughs> to get on, get this thing to happen. I was actually supposed to be in uh, in your neck of the woods down in Southern California, San Diego area last July. I was doing a podcast tour in Sacramento and San Diego, and you were you were uh, you and I had been introduced through a mutual connection, and you were going to be on my show. And I was at, we were actually going to do I was going to be on your show. We we're going to do back to back. I think that was the plan. And then I got vertigo and had to cancel half of that trip and come back. But nevertheless, here we are. It is now January of 2022. We're finally able to get together. And uh, I'm honored and excited to talk to you. Uh, you got a very interesting story. And I know we're going to have, uh, have some fun today. But, man, I'm just, I'm just glad, you're, glad you're here, dude. Thank you. It's so... It's such a testament to how success works, too, right? Like it, we, we plan for things to go a certain way. And like st- life happens, things happen, right? It's not always as intense as COVID or, or vertigo, but like things always happen that are unplanned. And it, it's cool to be here, what, almost probably six, eight months later, whatever, whatever it is, and go, hey, we still did what we said we were going to do regardless of the circumstances. It just didn't happen on the timeline that we thought. You know, yeah, it, yeah. Our, our ability to adapt will always outperform our ability to plan. I'm a firm believer mm-hmm. in that law. And I know that you know that law as well. And, and so here we are, we've adapted well. And I'm actually coming from a hotel in Florida. You're, you're at your place in, in uh, Southern California. But um, I would rather be live in person with you where it's warmer and sunnier than it is right now because it's really cold. <laughs> it's not supposed to be cold in Florida, but it's cold right now. i got a sweater on. <laughs> It's, it's colder here, and it's cold. It's colder than it should be here in Southern California. So it's probably we're probably about the same. We're it's supposed to be warm on both coasts. We're both in the two places that it's always supposed to have nice weather, and both of us are, you know, in long pants and long shirts. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the first time I ever went to San Diego, I went to a conference. Um, it was I don't know how many years ago it was, but it was the first time I'd ever been. I was really excited. All all I'd ever heard my whole life. It never rains in San Diego. It's always warm, and it was in May. So I thought this is going to be fantastic. I didn't take any long sleeves, nothing. And it was uh, freezing is not the right word. I'm using hyperbole, but it was freezing. I had to go to one of the shops in the lamp, isn't it like a gas lamp district or something like that? Yeah. Had to, yeah. We were eating dinner there and I had to go to one of the shops and buy a San Diego zip up hoodie because I was absolutely freezing to death. Now my wife wears that hoodie to this day all the time. I lost it, but <laughs> that was the first time I went to San Diego. I'm like, man, the brochures are lying to me. All the songs about... <laughs> That's Southern California weather. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Well, it's, let's talk about let's talk about success, man. This is uh, this is the root of all success. You're a very successful guy. Um, I mentioned in your in the intro about all of the accolades that you've had. Quite a wild ride from um, doing what you've done to doing what you're doing now. And one of the biggest, coolest parts of your story that um, I didn't really get into a lot in the intro, but I, I wanted to save it for a discussion is uh, is your love adventure, the thing that you did, the contest. And I definitely, definitely want to get there. So we're going to go there. We're going to talk about that. But I want to ask you this first. How did you how did you get your start as an entrepreneur? If you think back to some people's story starts when they were kids, you know, mowing grass or shoveling snow. You didn't if you live in Southern California, but doing those types of tasks as a kid. Uh, but others don't start until they're 30 or whatever. But what, so what was your entry into entrepreneurship? You know, it's, I love it how you asked that and how you said it. Cause I've never, I'm going to answer it in a way that I've never answered before. When I was in elementary school, I remember them having, you know, they had like sell wrapping paper, sell magazines, all those content things. And they would get, you know, they'd have all these prizes, right? The, the silliest things, you know, this, a guitar that has buttons on it. It's not even a real guitar. And for some reason, as a little kid, I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to win. I'm going to win. And I won two years in a row. I think I won like, yeah, I don't know, magazine drive or from the whole school. I won two years in a row 
and I won, you know, the dumbest little things. But when I think back, that really was the start because that was the first time I was door knocking. You know, I would get home, I would get home from school. I'd go to my baseball practice or whatever sport I was playing at the time. And then I'd tell my parents, I got to go, I got to go sell magazines. I got to sell, you know, wrapping paper, whatever it was. And my mom usually would like walk the dogs and she'd walk, you know, I'm in elementary school. She can't let me just wander around Los Angeles. She'd stay, you know, a few, a few houses behind, just keep an eye on me. And I'd walk up to doors all by myself, knock on the door and I would sell whatever it was I was selling. That had to be my first venture. If I'm really honest, right, that's that was <laughs> entrepreneurship. Well, yeah, for sure. I mean, entrepreneurship starts, if you don't know how to sell, it's going to be really difficult to be an entrepreneur. And I think all of us uh, who are entrepreneurs can think back to that time when we were selling popcorn as, a, you know, or, or cookies or magazines mm-hmm. or something. We sold something or, or we mowed grass or we shoveled snow or we raked leaves. We did something. And for a lot of us, that spark, that spark back then, even as a kid, uh, is what what made us desire the entrepreneurial journey later. So now you did that as a kid. Uh, you grow up, of course, you're not selling magazines today. <laughs> so you grow up and you go on to different things. College, you went to the University of Southern California. What did you study and, and did that lead you into more entrepreneurship or, or did you go to the corporate world? What what happened next after after college and what did you study there? I got, lo- I got actually got lost in this journey and I got stuck in that, that rap of like, you're supposed to go to college. So I think if I had, if I trusted myself as a, as a, you know, 18 year old, whatever it was, I would not have gone to college. I don't know what I would have done. Everything would be different, but I went to college out of high school because that's what you were, you know, this is the year 2000. That's what you were supposed to do. That's, if you want to be successful, you got to go to college, right? This is pre- people selling things on Instagram and social media. This is pre-podcasting, right? It's not that, it's 22 years ago. It's not that long ago, but it is, it was a a different world. Entrepreneurship was different and whatnot. And so I went to college and college was, I actually went to four colleges in four years. I did graduate from USC uh, for my last, it was my last two years, but I, I was not good at college. And I just was trying to get through. It also though was the first time that I realized I was actually smart. At college was the first time I realized, whoa, I, I can have intelligent debate. I can conversate with people. I can form intellectual, in, in, intellectual conversation. So it did give me something that I might not have gotten if I had just gone on to the real world. So that was the start. But then I, I went into restaurants. I was a bartender. I was a waiter. I was the guy training the bartenders and waiters in those early years of my 20s because I didn't know what to do. I, I would have loved to be in an entrepreneurship. My dad was an entrepreneur, but I didn't, you know, there was no, there was no Grant Cardone or Gary V <laughs> or, you know, Jason Duncan's teaching people about these alternate routes. If you were an entrepreneur, I want to say then you you were kind of ahead of the curve because there wasn't the the structures that there are now. Um, you know, you yes. said something interesting. You said something interesting. You said that you didn't realize you were smart or you discovered that you were smart. I don't know how you said it yeah. in college. What? T- tell me a little bit about that. Dig in a little bit on that. What, what did that? What do you mean by that? When I was when I was young, like elementary school, junior high age, I was diagnosed with some learning disabilities. Now, as an adult, if you understand the way the mind works and you dig into like neuroplasticity and and, and brain science. One of the things we would learn is that every mind works differently. So our school system is built to to create a box that if you don't fit into that box, you're essentially left out of, you're not smart or you're left behind or you're in remedial classes or whatever. Well, I wasn't wasn't at that point, but I remember being in elementary school and when they plucked out, I was the popular kid, you know, I had a lot of friends, I was good at sports. But then they did this test and all all my friends got plucked out to go to the gifted classes because of my learning disabilities, I struggled with reading comprehension and um, being able to actually read well at that point in my life and also language and all these things that would have shown up on a test as, as poor. But I related to that as a little kid, like I wasn't smart. That was the narrative that got written into my, you know, into my programming essentially at a really young age. So I went through high school, basically, you know, those young years going, all right, well, I'm cute. I'm good at sports and I'm popular. That's what I can hang my hat on. And I just was like, I'm just not smart. That's one of those things. And so 
as we get older though, right? I was a baseball player. Well, I wasn't good enough to really go past high school with baseball. So that fell away. Sports fall away. That's not access anymore. You don't have access to that anymore. You know, being charismatic can get you pretty far, but it doesn't get you into college. <laughs> That's not yeah. going to help you get to college. And your looks don't really get you. So the things that I had kind of leaned on, I didn't have. And so I ended up uh, going to college, not having the ability to succeed at the level I wanted and getting into the hospitality business or in that point, but the, the beginning phases of college, college was different. And I was in community college, just it was one of the first colleges I went to, it was the second actually. And when I realized in community college was a lot of the people at community college were so much more lost. And I was actually able to really succeed because of my intelligence. It wasn't about could I pass a test? It was more about, could I create debate? Could I create conversation? Could I express myself with my, with my language? And I was able to do that. And for the first time, I think I was in a history class and a teacher recommended me for a program at UCLA, which UCLA is a great school for a special program that I got paid. And I was like, wait, I'm the kid. I'm the guy that got recommended to go get paid to take a class. You yeah. can get credit. And, and that was, it was really great the way that it happened because it was the first time that I went, okay, I'm not dumb. You know, I didn't, I wasn't all the way there. I hadn't rewritten the narrative, but there was possibility. Yeah. That's a, that's an interesting perspective, man. I, I wonder how many people are listening right now grew up with, grew up with the same sort of story that you had in terms of, you know, your, your, the disability that they, that they might have has held them back from opportunities and they kind of label themselves based on, that disability, as opposed to their ability to do certain things. I'm glad that you found your way through it on the, on the other side of it. And a lot of people are still stuck in that mentality that they're, you know, because they're dyslexic or they have trouble, you know, trouble with comprehension or the vocabulary, or maybe they have a speech impediment, whatever it happens to be that's holding them back. I think they can push beyond that. I, I there was a story you might, you might know this story and I've heard it told several times uh, I don't have the details but because I wasn't planning on telling the story, but the guy that uh, who who never studied, wasn't really doing anything in school, took the SAT and ended up scoring like, I don't know what, 1600, the norm, the, like the highest or something yeah, like that. It used to be. I, yeah, I don't and know. He, what he scored 1500 or something. And people were like, "This you cheated. And he's like, I didn't cheat, you know. And and they they because of that, they figured out he didn't cheat. It was all legit. And uh, he ended up thinking, well, I'm smart. So he got success, gets accepted this college. He, he goes on to this amazing career. And then 10 years down the road, he finds they, the SAT company reaches out and said, hey, man, we, we just want to let you know that you didn't actually score that. There was a mistake. And there were a handful of kids that had a mistake. And you really scored like a 700 or something. But, but because he thought uh, that he was yeah. smart, like he went on to create this amazing company and he became a millionaire. It's, isn't it amazing how our mindset? Well, and how it is and how screwed up is it that we as a society do so much labeling and boxing in and we do it to kids. You're, hey, you're not athletic. You're not smart. You're not going to be good at this. These are not your strengths. You know, we constantly, and I don't think most of us are doing it on purpose to, to, our, to our kids or to the society, but we as parents and as, as the, the leaders, teachers and whatnot, I think there's this thing like we want to protect them. We want to protect them. We want to create realistic situations. And ultimately we start implanting all these stories and these narratives. And to your point, if we gave them a different narrative, what would be possible? You know, I would so much rather try to make a million dollars and only make 500,000 because it would be so terrible to make $500,000, right? You'd still have a great life. Then say, hey, you know what? You're probably only going to ever make like 100,000 you know, and then you never know what maybe you could have done if you were kind of shooting for the stars. Yeah. So many people uh, hide behind their excuses. And I talked about in the beginning at the, at your, um, at the intro that you, Yahoo Finance labeled you the anti-excuses coach. Where did that come from? When I started coaching, I, <laughs> I didn't have a lot of empathy and compassion. Let's say that. Like <laughs> I, I had come from the restaurant industry, crazy, you know, fast moving, get things done. Don't give me excuses. Let's like, if we mess up, let's fix it. Let's just very masculine, you know, A to Z results kind of business. And 
I would like fake it. You know, if you came to my restaurant, you had a bad experience, I would pretend like I felt bad. And it was just like, how do I, you know, make you feel good? So you can come spend more money. It wasn't real. And when I got into coaching, I had to do the work myself. I got kind of wrung out and re like almost, you know, in the military, we break people down to build them back up. Well, I had that done trans in a transformational way. Let's break him down, his beliefs, his stories, his ideas, and then let's put him back together from, from who he not only really is at the core, but who he wants to be. And, but when I started coaching my first clients, I had, did not have a lot of compassion and empathy. And I would come in as like hard nose, like it's an excuse. Uh, you're, that's a circumstance. Like, what are we going to do? Right. It was just like running through walls. And I think luckily I had some really brilliant people around me. One being my mom, my mom's a marriage and family therapist. So she's coming from, it's not necessarily about the results. It's a lot more of compassion and listening. And she would reflect that back to me a lot. And through other ways, through clients that were very needed more of something else, I learned that I had to have both, that I can't just pound you into submission as your coach. I, I need to really be able to hear you and see you and see what you need in the moment. So there's some people, right? Like I'm, when I go to the gym, I, you might be like this too. I don't need feelings work me like a dog at the gym, <laughs> right? Like that's what I'm there for. Ring me out, like get me to sweat, make me hurt. But I think like in sales, in other industries, we don't have to have success like that. I think that's a, we can, it's, you totally can do that. But I think there's a lot of ways that we can achieve success. And for sometimes for some people, it's actually letting them be heard and letting them feel because they're trapping all, all their feelings and stuff and bearing it down. And that's actually what's getting in the way. So the anti-excuses thing was really my hard nose. One of my favorite clients says to me, working with me is like being hugged and punched in the face at the same time. <laughs> uh, and so I think that's, that's, that's a lot where that comes from. So how do you, this is the root of all success after all. So how do you define the term success? What, what does Alex Terranova, somebody said, what's success? How do you, how would you define it? So I think there's a few things for me. It's, it's, it's happiness. Cause I, I think that's, I wish it was a, uh, a requirement for being alive that we like allowed and encouraged everyone to actually be happy. Um, what I notice is no matter how much money I have, no matter how much my, money my clients have, no matter what their relationships looks like, if they're not happy, then it's kind of all a waste. So for me, happiness is the core of, um, of success. And then there's things like authenticity, if I don't get to actually be myself, right? When I, when we described who I was before, oh, I, I got to go to college because I'm supposed to. That to me, if you're doing things that, you, that don't really feel true to you, then you're not successful. I think integrity, integrity is a big one. Happiness, authenticity, integrity. Integrity for me is the anchor that supports the success of all of my life. That I think, the thoughts that I think, the words that I speak and the actions that I take are all in alignment. I think all three of these things, if I'm happy, if I'm authentic, and if I have integrity, I think then anything else I want is possible. So for wow. me, though, to me, that's success. And then the money, the stuff, the relationships all becomes possible because of those things. So yeah, I want all those, I want all those things too, right? Like I, I want all that stuff, but I don't, but all that stuff without those three, it's not a successful life to me. I, I would agree with that. And I think that's why I love doing this show, man, because I, I, everybody I ask that question to, they've all got different answers to it. Now, the, de the dictionary definition of success is getting the results you in intended to get or wanted to get at the mm. beginning. If you got the results, that's success. But, but uh, everybody's flavor of what that looks like with yours being happiness and authenticity and integrity, I think is a really cool perspective. So let me ask you this, with that in mind, as the definition of success, do you consider yourself a successful person? It's tough. So it's, that's, it's, this is probably one of my greatest challenges because I'm so aware that society has bred me to want money to be the measuring stick. And it's, the def it's like the default. I think of humans often as like we're basically computer programs. And if you think about computer has code. Uh, our, our, main, our brains work like that. And I think that society has really inputted this code that success equals finance is financially measured. 
Mm-hmm. And even though in my heart and like, I'm telling you, I know that in my bones, I know that that's not the measurement. It's still the, that code is still there and I'm constantly fighting against it. So if I'm like really honest, yes. It's like even hard for me to say, yes, I believe I'm successful because I'm happy. I live where I want to live. I'm in an amazing relationship. I have a great relationship with my family. I have great people around me. I get to wake up and do what I want to do most days. And for the most part, I have everything that I need and everything that I want for the most part. And there's that little voice that chirps, but your house could be bigger, right? You could go on more trips or fancier trips. So yes. And I'm being really honest and vulnerable with you that it's hard to say that because there's that voice. Yeah. I, well, what's funny about that, Alex, is that, that I ask that question of everybody on the show. Um, and when I say, do you consider yourself a successful person? About 50% of the people immediately respond with some version of yes. And the other 50% do a version of what you did. It, it's still a yes, but it's like couched among, in this well, but I'm st- there's still more that I want to accomplish. So, so I think you're right. Like you're, you're right in the half, you know, halfway point. I think that the, the, the spectrum goes both ways. But what's interesting about your definition with happiness, authenticity, and integrity being what success is authenticity doesn't seem to be like um it doesn't seem to be like a result of of something it it more is like an intention but i but what you said and what i like about this and i don't know if you meant to say it this way i think you probably did but you said when you're successful you get to be authentic and i i think that was an interesting perspective because we so many times we we are trying to be authentic uh, but when we're successful, we get to be, and that's, and this is, this is a, maybe a stupid example, but I think everybody listening will know exactly what I mean. Older, older people don't give one flying flip about what anybody thinks. And you're talking about authentic, they're authentic. So for them, like, hell man, I lived in 95 years old. I'm going to say what I want, when I want, I don't care what you think. It doesn't matter. Now, some of them are rude, but, but what I mean is they get to be authentic. And I think for very successful people like you, like me, we get to be authentic because we've designed a life that lets us be that way. That's success. I love that definition. I never heard anybody say that before. That's I want to cool. I want to throw something in, like is maybe some gasoline and a matchstick into what you said about <laughs> old people. I don't think most people are authentic, regardless of age, and I don't even think they realize it. So the my book is called the book that I wrote. First book I wrote is called Fictional Authenticity. Because the idea is we think thick, it's like a, it, our authenticity is fictional. We, and I was this, right? My book is really, it's not, I'm not calling everyone else out. I'm saying I was like this and I'm, and I'm showing. I think that from the moment we're born, we're like, you drink, you ever drink smoothies? This is my favorite way to describe this. Yeah. Right. So when you get, let's just say you get a pint glass, everyone knows what a pint glass is. Let's say it's clear glass. It's perfectly clean. That's you when you're born. You are a perfectly clean, sparkly pint glass. And then with everything that happens to you, good or bad or or otherwise, it's like pouring a little smoothie little by little into that pint glass, right? So your parents do things, you get hurt, you fail a test, you pass a test, you have sex, you get rejected, you get a job, you lose a job, right? Somebody beats you up, all the stuff in your life. At some point, that glass becomes full or mostly full. Well, now if we dump that smoothie out of that glass, what ha- what's the glass look like? Yeah, it's dirty. It's got the residue. Yeah. And that's to me, most of us get into, I think this is why people have midlife crisis and things, you know, in their thirties or forties or fifties is they suddenly become aware of the residue. The residue has been there, but we're behaving in ways and living our life because of the, our parents, our community, our churches, our temples, the media, politicians, the shows, the music we like that we crafted a version, like we wrote a story of who we were and what was authentic, but it was so manipulated subconsciously by the world we live in that we don't actually even know who we are. And that when you see those like older people, you know, your example of the older people, now some of them maybe, but I think most of us haven't actually do the, done the work to clean that glass back out and go, man, who was I before, my, you know, all these forces, got their gunk all over me that's my favorite thing to actually do with clients is that is exercises to go hey who were you as a clean glass before 
all this stuff. Now, none of that stuff is good or bad, right? It's just, that's just how our universe works and our world works. So I'm really committed to constantly pulling down the narratives. I mean, look, in my relationship, I was looking for women that fit the narrative, not what my heart really wanted. It was like, hey, who am I supposed to be with based on a subconscious belief of what I find attractive, what their attitude is like, where they live, you know, all these things. Yeah. Well, that's a, you know, it's interesting that you're, you talk about your book, Fictional Authenticity. I I, I want to go, I want to actually read that book. I've not read your book. I'm admitting it right here on the show, but I want to, <laughs> I want to read the, I want to read the book because I have this theory about a contrived authenticity. And I don't know if it matches with what you're talking about in the book specifically, but this theory that I've got about contrived authenticity is that that's where our world is kind of designed for us with social media for the most part is that we have to contrive some sort of authenticity. Now contrive can be, and it is most of the time seen as a negative thing where if you contrive something, it's negative, you're trying to lie. But the reality is what I believe the contrived authenticity is that in social media, there's algorithms that we have to play by on the rules in order to get our message out there. So where if we were truly authentic with no, you know, no limitations, no hesitations, um, we would never make it through the algorithmic uh, jungle. We would never, nobody ever see our stuff. But if we can be authentic, but contrive it to play within the rules, we can get out there. So I don't know if your book talks about that, but I, I want to, I want to read it because I, th- I, I think, I don't know if my theory would be uh, exposed as a fraud or not. <laughs> well, I think, I think what you're saying is totally true. And I think it's almost the next, it's like part two, like you're, what you're saying is after you become authentic, when you, once you, I'm saying, Hey, we need to kind of scrape the smoothie glass and see who we really are. And then if we say, Oh, I'm like this. And you say, I want to share that with the world. Now, how do I share that with the world so that it gets across? Yeah. I think you're talking about like, how do I take my authenticity and then have it land over somewhere else? Right. Right. Be- And I think that's the toughest thing. I'm just going to use dating as an example. I used to think that for me to be successful in dating, the contrived way is like, I had to be like this. I kind of had to be like laissez-faire, a little bit of bad boy, a little bit like push some buttons. You know, I had to do these things because that would have me be successful to have have that uh, like authentic response that I wanted. And what I learned is that simply got me a match for this false way of showing up. Mm-hmm. And that when I became who I really was, and then I said, okay, you know what? I'm going to date. I'm going to start dating from fun, adventure, integrity, um, like real honesty. And, and let's see what happens. All of a sudden it changed the result I was getting, but it was still successful. Just It just looked different. It's interesting that you use dating as an example because you went on this adventure over the last seven or eight months and you created this, your love adventure kind of dating contest thing. And I'm teasing this out because I want people to stick around and listen to it. Cause it's, I think it's such a cool story. But before we get to that, <laughs> I want to ask you, I want to ask you about dream Mason because you, you've got a podcast uh, dream Masons and, and you've got, you started a company dream Masons incorporated where I talked about that in the intro, but you started that after a, a, a career in the corporate world, building huge businesses Etc. Why? Wh- what happened that made you go? Ooh, I got to change out of this and go in to do my own thing. I need to start my own company. What? What? Cha- what? What inspired that change? We're going to take a break from our show right now to bring you our sponsors. All right. Thanks for listening to our sponsors. Now back to the show. I, I first I got really lucky. I think you know I, I'm sure you've interviewed people and we see people all the, every every day where like they get cancer and they're like, Oh my God, I got to change my life. Or somebody, they get in a car accident or someone around them dies, but they have these dramatic moments that shake up their life that they go, I got to change. I was 32 years old. I was living in New York. I was doing really, I was a director of operations for a, a really amazing and growing restaurant group. They had a great girlfriend life on all in, in all intensive purposes was really good. And I went to Costa Rica with my family and my cousin, who's very spiritual, works with women, um, and, and really spends a lot of time in emotions and that like emotional development and, and helping people heal from traumas, wasn't enjoying the time we were having as a family. And you know how families are, right? They're tough at times. And to kind of reset the energy, she asked everyone to go around the table and say what they were grateful for. Well, at 32, and for most of my life, when I would get that question, I would have to deflect. I couldn't be with actually, you know, I couldn't deal with emotions and things. Me and my brother would make inappropriate jokes. We'd, you know, we would, 
we couldn't actually just say what we were grateful for. And my brother didn't come on that trip and there was no one kind of for me to do that with. And I, when they got to me, I wish I could explain what happened. Um, if people that have are, are people that have faith in some sort of God or something bigger than us, I think they understand it. I was not one of those people, but the way I see it now is the, is God, the universe, whatever you want to believe it like slapped me right up, right in the face or punched me right in the nose in that moment. Cause she asked me that. And I burst into tears. I was not somebody who cried. I was a bro. I was a sports guy. I was a, you know, and I burst into tears, like sobbing. And all of a sudden I realized how much of a jerk I was like, I had this great life. I'm not grateful for any of it. All I want is more. And in that moment, I could see how much I had to be grateful for, like how great my life was and how lucky I was to live the life I was living. And I went back to New York with my girlfriend at the time and was like, I'm, I'm changing everything. I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna stop watching TV. I'm, I'm canceling my cable. I'm canceling Netflix. I'm gonna start reading books. I'm gonna read a book a week. Um, I'm gonna be positive instead of being pessimistic, negative, or realistic. People always think realists are is a thing. No, it's not. Nobody, nobody ever says realistically this is gonna go great. It's real realists are it's a nice way to cover up for, for negativity or pessimism. And uh I was like, you know what? If I want to be a happy person, it's gotta start here. I gotta be, I gotta generate this. And that's kind of how the journey started. So I changed, I started changing my eating habits, my exercise. Um the way I would be with people. And that was the beginning of the journey. And about a year ish later, I had a, my first coach who said to me, Hey, you don't like what you're doing. You're not happy. Why don't you quit? And that was that first moment I went, yeah, like what's the worst thing that could happen? You know, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to be homeless. I'm not going to have, I have, I have too much community and support. Like I'll figure this out I'm, and I'm resilient. And I decided through my own transformation that I wanted to help people the way my coach had helped me. So that's kind of how the business got, that's, that's how it all got started. Wow. That that's really, that's really cool, man. And I think that um, that moment of clarity you had at that dinner table, a, a lot of people don't, don't get that opportunity. So you, you had that moment of clarity that really changed the trajectory of your life. When you decided to start Dream Masons, why did you pick that name? What does that mean? <laughs> um, I was actually in a hot yoga class. I quit going to the gym for a while because the gym just felt like the comfortable place to be. So I would do things that made me uncomfortable. That was part of my kind of transformation. I, so I, would, I started going to yoga because I'm this dude who spent all this time in the gym. I walk into a yoga class. Everybody basically is like women in, you know, Lululemon. I feel uncomfortable and I had to be with that, that I think that forced growth, right? It, that forced me to grow being in discomfort and I'm lying in this hot yoga class one day and I hated the term. I'm not a big fan of like life coach, business coach. It's like, what does all this mean? Right. And I'm lying there and I see, I could see like in the, in the kind of depletedness of this class, I could see the word dream Mason and it hit me like a, that we're, I'm not the, I'm not a dream. I'm not the dream Mason. Like I make your dreams come true. Right. I'm not a genie. I'm not a God that you work with me and I make it happen for you. What I believe is that we're all dream Masons because all of us from the moment we were born somewhere along the line, we all had a dream. Some of us had those dreams stomped out early on. Some of them last long, but we all had a dream at some point in our life. And the only way any of our dreams come true is to build it which is like ma masonry, right? Is to build, is essentially to build something. And it just made sense. Like, hey, I want to help people build their dreams. It doesn't matter if your dream is a marriage or building a, a, you know, a 10 figure company. How can I be, you know, that support structure for you to help you create that life that you want? Now you created, you started your co coaching company, the Dream Mason Incorporated, Dream Mason. And, and, but you also have Dream Mason podcasts. So what is that podcast? Because I want to promote that here for these listeners yeah. to go and listen to that. What does the Dream Mason podcast focus on? So the Dream Mason podcast is, is actually on hiatus because I am re, I'm like in a process of reinventing what I want, what I want it to be, right? What the, my next vision, because my first dream was when, when it came to a podcast was I wanted to do 100 episodes. I wanted to do 200 episodes. 
And I, I did all those things and I had it going for about four years and it reached a top 2% podcast in the world. And I noticed that I wasn't having any fun anymore. So it, I, it's just been on hiatus for a few months. So there's episodes up until like the end, pretty much the end of 2021. But for the, for four years, it was thought leaders, innovators, creators. So we had people, um, that had built massive companies that were worth millions of maybe even billions of dollars. Uh, I had some, I had some professional athletes. I had some scientists that created or innovated in their industry. I had people that were in college, college entrepreneurs that were making thousands of dollars a month while it, from their dorm rooms. So it really was, I would say a show about dream masons. And people would tell their story of what they've overcome, what they've done, how they've created it, and like the lessons they've learned. And then there's some episodes where I, you know, it's just me and I talk about, you know, my journey and, and challenges I've faced, a lot of relationship stuff in there. Uh, but it, it was a fun ride. I just think it's time. I think I love the idea of reinvention. What's next? Are, how do I are you doing the, are you still doing the Frequency Shifter show? Yeah, Frequency Shifters is, we're working on season two. So it's a, it's a show that's based on, uh, it sees it seasons instead of just an ongoing. Um, and it's with a good friend of mine. It's her, it's her show that she asked me to co-host with her. And it's all about kind of the unseen stuff. So the unseen, some people would call it the woo woo spirituality, but we bring on people that are talking about things that maybe we just can't see or understand. And I love it because I get to kind of be, I'm like more your skeptic. I'm like more your everyman. And I get to really dive in and say, wait a minute, if you sing to a plant, it's going to grow. Explain this to me because that doesn't make any <laughs> sense. And, they, and they're bringing the science and, and that. And I think it's, it's, it's a really nice way for people that don't know about this stuff to step in without being like, well, it's too much. I got, you know, I got to get away from this. What about the other show, the the coaching show podcast? What about that one? Yeah, the coaching show is actually, I think you'll love this. The coaching show podcast has been on the air for 20 years. It was a internet radio show before it was there were podcasts. And my mentor is the host of that show. He's been coaching for about I don't know, 20, 30 years. The show's been around for about 20 years. And I co-host that. Sometimes I host it for him if he's not there. But that show is just about coaching. So we just bring on leaders in coaching thought, you know, thought leaders, actual coaches, um, people that are supporting the coaching industry. And, and that's just strictly coaching show, but it's great. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. And you got, you actually, you're a PCC. So your first professional certified coach, when did, when did you decide to go do that? And how long have you had your PCC certification? So, you know, certifications are, <laughs> we live in a world where you can do anything you want now. Right. right. Um, I, I'm a big believer in challenging myself, as I said. So I went through a really formal, intensive, intensive, intensive year-long coach training program. Um, and I think that was important because, you know, I'm committed to my clients. I don't want to like pretend like I can help them and not really be able to. So for me, it was really important to be, to do it like with integrity, I should say, right? Like to, to be able to be the person I said I wanted to be. And I had never been a coach. I didn't, I didn't know. So I went through that training and one of the things I loved about the training program I went through accomplishment coaching was they were very much like, it was very integrity driven where, Hey, if you're going to do something, do it right and do it professionally. So get, you know, the essentially like pass the tests, get, get, get evaluated, make sure you're doing a good job. And so for me, it's funny, I go out in the world and no one ever asks me, I'm working on my master certified coach certification right now in eight years, no one's ever said, are you certified as a coach? Yeah. But for me, I do it because to become a master certified coach is a challenge. It's hard. It's not, this is not an easy thing, but it makes me get better and better and keep improving. And to me, that supports my commitment to my clients. Yeah. Well, that's very interesting. I know that when, when I started my, uh, when I started coaching years ago, I was doing it just, I was still running my company as CEO, but I was coach. I had several entrepreneurs I was coaching kind of on the side. And, and when I began to prepare for the exit of my company, I knew I wanted to go into some form of coaching or speaking. And I looked into coaching certifications and uh, applied to several of them and, and was ready to start. I picked one. I was ready to start. And ultimately, I, I made the decision to attempt to get my Ph.D. instead, take the same same nice. route. But but I didn't get the Ph.D. I started and didn't get it. So but I, I'm with you. Nobody asks about it. 
but the process of going through it makes you a better coach. That's, mm-hmm. that's what the whole point. Now I've been teasing this the whole time we've been talking about this, the, the, your love adventure, because I think this is such a cool, cool story. So you, and this is, this is of course, uh, the, the, you're a non-traditional entrepreneur for, as a guest on my show, but I think what you did with this event or event, uh, this uh, adventure, I guess, is a very big entrepreneurial undertaking that you thought at the beginning, I think the way you so, told it to me was you didn't really expect it to do anything, but it caught on and boom. And now uh, you're, you turned out really well for you. And I'm going to let you, I don't, I don't want to steal the thunder, but so here I'm going to, I'm going to position it the way I see it. And I want you to tell me that, tell me everybody the details. So you were tired of the dating scene, uh, like all the apps and all that kind of stuff. So you decided to create your own, um, your own bachelor contest to figure out how to find the right girl, the right woman. Mm-hmm. And that's uh, called your love adventure. Now and I've set it up. That's kind of interesting. What happened? So originally, um, well, it was originally the Tulum dating experiment because when 2020 started, I had two tickets to Tulum to go to a really good friend's wedding and I was dating someone and it didn't work out. And then I was dating someone else in 2020 and it didn't work out. And then I was dating someone else in the beginning of 2021 and it didn't work out. And dating has always been, had always been fun. And one day I realized it's not fun anymore. I'm like, like, how did this process just like become so like checks and boxes and just like doing the chore to get the girl and go on the date. And, and I, and I had that realization. And I went, I was sitting in a bar with my cousin in Santa Barbara, California, and we were having a few drinks. And I said, you know, it's not the problem of meeting or finding women. I don't have that issue, whether it be apps or non-apps but it seems like I keep choosing the wrong women for me. Like, I wanna be really clear, great women, not the right ones for me. And my cousin jokingly goes, I mean, I'll pick pick girls for you or something, you know? And and she is similar. Sometimes I can point out, hey, you shouldn't be dating that guy, you know? (laughs) Uh, And we were like, well, what if you picked who I date? And what if you picked who went to Tulum with me? And she goes, yeah, I, I'll do this. And in within 24 hours, two or three friends of other friends heard about this conversation and went, wait, I want to do this. And in this next 24 hours, I jokingly put a post on social media that was like, I got two tickets for Tulum. You know, you got to be a woman. You got to be single. You got to, you know, there was a few requirements. Who wants to go? I thought, you know, a few friends of mine would be like, I want to go take me. It went viral. And with every day, it went more, vi- it, it kept going, be getting more traction. And within 24 hours of that, so now we're only like two, three days out from that drinking conversation. I went, I'm getting DMs, I'm getting messages. I'm seeing people are, women are sharing it with other women in chat rooms and like, like Facebook groups. And I'm going, oh my God, I just got to go with this. And I love this. What, what's really cool is Grant Cardone talks about this with building a business. Most people, when they start a business, he's like, oh, I got to get lawyers, trademarks, blah, 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 blah. And they never actually do anything. And then it all fizzles out. And his motto, Grant Cardone is like, I get excited and I start. And then everything, and I just start doing the business. I start promoting it. And then I start figuring it out. And unknowingly, that's what I did. I'm I'm now, like we created a landing page, like within a few hours, we created an application created a committee of five people that would decide who gets to go with me to Tulum because I was also aware, Hey, if I pick, I'm just going to pick just like the way I've always been picking. And that's what people loved was it was like, Hey, this guy isn't just like, Hey, women come, come, you, you, you know, come, it's not, it wasn't like a contest, like come with me to Tulum. I'm so great. It was like, Hey, I'm looking for love. I'm looking for the real thing. I haven't done a good job. So I have a blind spot and I picked a committee of people three women, two men who are going to pick the person that would be the best match for me. Now, right. Two weeks in Tulum with somebody you've never met. It's a big ask, right? It's a, that could be scary. That's right? what they do on television though, right? <laughs> yeah. But I think on television, there's some you. Th- we think there's some vetting, right? There's like some producer, there's people like in charge and we trust it's on TV. No one's going to get murdered. A lot of women would be like, how do I know you're not going to murder me? <laughs> Tulum. I had one person's mom reach out and go, how do I know you're not going to murder my daughter? 
Um, what was amazing about this is I approached this from adventure, from fun, from not knowing what the hell I was doing. I just kept like running towards, running towards what I was committed to, which was love, fun, and adventure. And it kept getting bigger and getting more steam to the point where I was on tons of podcasts. I was on the morning news in San Diego. And the women that had to apply, think about it. You, they gotta be up for adventure, right? You can't, they're not, they can't be shy or scared. They have to be willing. They, they look at my profile. There's a lot of things that weeded a lot of people out right away. People afraid to go to Chulum, share a room with a guy for two weeks they've never met before. And so it was interesting to see the process. And then once I met the, when I started meeting the women, you don't have a lot of time to pretend to be someone else. You know, think about when we're dating, yeah. we're like, we're, we're trying to get people to like us. We don't want to ruffle too many feathers in the beginning, but because of this contest and the times, the, the lapse of time, you know, I'm on, I'm FaceTiming with these women who are like the, the kind of the ones towards the end as we're getting closer to picking, getting to know each other. And we're digging into stuff that really matters. We're having hard, intense conversations right at the beginning, which have some people go away and some people stay and some people triggered and whatnot. And by the 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 judges picked our our you know our winning woman i don't know how to say it there's no good way to say it um but our judges picked a woman her name is evan rose she's my girlfriend now we're we're now you know months into this thing um and she was the person that i would have picked from from an like the evolved heart space the guy who used to date wouldn't have picked her for all sorts of stupid reasons. But the, what I really, she's exactly what I wanted and I'm what she wanted, which is wild. And we went, we dated for a few weeks before and then we went to Tulum for two weeks, fell in love in Tulum, like could see a whole life together, came back and we've been, she lives in LA, I live in San Diego. So we, um, just since October, we did Thanksgiving with my family. We did Christmas with my family. We went to Florida and visited her mom and her 99-year-old grandmother. Um, we're about to go to my brother's wedding next week um, or, you know, the, whatever the time frame is, but like, you know, in the near future. And um, we're creating a life together. She's going to, you know, we're going to move in together soon. And from a wild, wacky experiment that got created over booze, but I believe was a success because I had a vision of what I wanted. I was really firm in my commitment. I was honest about what I was looking for. And I created a support and accountability to help me not veer off track. And I think all of those things can be applied to anything in life. And her and I, she happens to be a dating and relationship coach for women. And her and I instantly were like, oh my God, there's, we have to be able to recreate this for other people. Not necessarily the way, exactly the way I did it, but the, the fundamental aspects and we created your love adventure. So right now people can see that on Instagram at your love adventure. The website will be up very, very soon. Um, and we're building an experience for to help people create their love, their, their love adventure or your love adventure. That's see that. And that's, that's what I think is so cool about that. Not only did it work, there were, it, it got you to the result you wanted, which is success. Um, so you, you met Evan Rose you go on this great adventure, you fall in love. Now you're planning a life together and you're doing the business together to help other people experience the same thing. And isn't that interesting as a coach, you, you, you were impacted so much by your own coach. You decided to go into coaching. You guys were impacted by this experience so much that you wanted to do this for other people. I believe that's where the magic is. If we're, if people listening to this show, if they want to hire a coach, if they want to hire a mentor, if they want to hire an advisor, a consultant, look for somebody who's done what you want. You don't, don't hire somebody who's not done it. They need practical experience. So if you want to go on a love adventure with somebody you've never met and let your friends pick them out, who better to have help you than Alex and Evan Rose? That's, <laughs> that's awesome, man. I, I totally agree with you. I tell, I often tell people, right? Like there, if, it, if all you care about is making money, I'm probably not the coach for you. There's coaches out there that are, that are vastly superior to me and they're just focused on making money. But if you want to create a great life, uh, I like that's the, I'm that coach. Cause we will make you money. We'll help you fall in love. We'll improve your communication and your relationship. And I think that is important because that's what I've done for myself, right? I've created, I've created a great life for myself where I have 
a lot of balance and a lot of things work all at the same time. And so I totally agree with you, right? There are, there are coaches for, if you just want love, there's a great coach out there for that. Evan being one of them. And you know, you're, you're in an entrepreneur, you built businesses, right? If you want to build businesses, like you're probably the coach for somebody who's like, Hey, I just want to build a business. Yeah. Well, let me, let me say this. So, um, you know, you, you've defined success as, as happiness and authenticity and integrity. Um, you've talked about how you've transitioned out of the corporate world and to doing your own thing, starting a podcast, helping a co-host other podcasts, doing this love adventure, meeting the love of your life as a result of this crazy, weird idea at a bar with your cousin. This is a, this is a story that I think inspires people to say, you can think outside the box. Entrepreneurship is not just about selling a product or a service. Sometimes it's about something bigger than that. Entrepreneurship is about risk and innovation. And you took a great risk by letting people pick your, your date. <laughs> you, you innovated by creating a way to do this in a way that other people haven't done before without all the sleaze and hype and, and crap that we see on television. You, you did it in an authentic way to go back to that word, authenticity from your definition of success. So I know that people listening to the show will want to get in touch with you, want to reach out to you. So how would, what's the best way for somebody to reach out to Alex Terranova? Probably Instagram or website. So, but I, I mean, I love Instagram. I'm on Instagram all the time. You know, it's like where I have fun, waste time. I also connect with so many people there. So inspirational Alex, inspirational Alex, just like it sounds, uh, the dreammason.com is my website. And if, if it's the, if you're like, Hey, I don't want any of this. I just want it's your love adventure on Instagram is the best. If you're just looking at that, that that's the best way to get over there. Well, Alex, thank you so much for being on the show, man. I want to give you the last word. Are there any, any pieces of advice you would give to young entrepreneurs out there who want to know and young by not, not age, but just early in the process, what advice would you give to him or her about, about what their journey is going to be? Ooh, I think you got to believe in yourself more than anything because it's not, it's, it's going to be a roller coaster. I don't care who you are, or what your idea is. If you got the billion dollar, you know, next tech company, the government's going to come after you. People are going to get, right? There's all, no matter how big, how small, how successful you're on a, a ebb and flow roller coaster. And if you don't trust yourself, I think you're you're ultimately bound for disaster because you're going to second guess, you're going to listen to other people, you're not going to follow your heart, you're going to give up when things get tough. The best things happen on the other side of things getting tough, but you don't get to get to the other side if you don't trust yourself. So I wish I wish I knew that right when I started. Now I was doing it, I was practicing it. That's why I I still have a business 7 8 years in, but if I could go back, it would, that would be the one thing it would be like, it's not the amount of sales calls. It's not the amount of, you know, hours of work. It's really about when, when I'm not succeeding, can I trust myself that I'm going to be okay? And that I just got to keep going forward. I love it, man. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. And I'll give a quick shout out to Nico. Nico was the guy that introduced the two of us. It's so good to meet you, to be able to have this opportunity to chat with you about your adventures. So Alex, it's an honor. Thank you for being on the route of all success. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thanks for making this work after all this time, too. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, man. Indeed. Well, there you have it. Alex Terranova, another very successful entrepreneur. Although, as I admitted at the beginning and in the show, a non-traditional entrepreneur in the sense of who I normally interview on the show, but very successful nonetheless. I loved his definition of success. Uh, about being about happiness and authenticity and integrity. And it's a, that's a good three-way check to see how you're living your life of success as an entrepreneur. Are you happy? Are, are you able to be authentic? Are you living in integrity? And if you are, according to Alex, that is a method, a measure, can't even talk today, a measure of success. And I think that that's, that's where we're all at. That's why I do the shows to help people just like you figure out how to be successful. Uh, speaking of that, I've got an offer for you. So I've got a membership program through my uh, through my website at therealjasonduncan.com uh, that you can join something. It's called The Successful Entrepreneur. So what, whether you want to be a successful entrepreneur or already are a successful entrepreneur, I do live Zoom trainings and webinars every single week, almost without fail, 
directly for the members of our online community. And it's a family of people from all over the world, community people from all over the world who are trying to be more successful, to make more of an impact. And dollar for dollar, it is the best investment you'll ever make in coaching. It's only $55 a month. And here's what you get in exchange for that $55 a month. Twice a month, you get access to me on a live group coaching open Q&A call. It's called Ask Jason Live. I do it twice a month where you can just dial in, get on the Zoom, and you can ask any question about leadership, entrepreneurship, financial literacy, sales. We It's just live coaching. And think about what you get, that value of two hours a month to sit down with me. And granted, it's not one-on-one. If it was one-on-one, it'd be a lot more expensive than $55 a month. But 55 bucks a month to get just those two calls, are, it's worth hundreds and hundreds of dollars just for 55 bucks. But not only that, I'll also do once a month, I do a success lecture. And that success lecture, again, is a private Zoom call just for members of the TSE, the Successful Entrepreneur. And I do one hour on some topic, whether it's related to sales, financial literacy, leadership, entrepreneurship, but very deep dive into one topic. Again, access to me as your coach for only 55 bucks a month. And then and then I also have two more things I do every month. Now, these last, these, these last two things is called the Entrepreneur Master Series. I do two of those a month. And those are actually opened up to the public. So anybody can register for those and come to those for free. However, your benefit as a member of TSC is that you get the complete library of every one of those webinars that I've just mentioned. You get all the past recordings. The people who are not members don't get that. But the Entrepreneur Master Series is a master class that I bring where I bring in an outside entrepreneur and we spend 90 minutes going really deep into the uh, tactics and practical applications of their expertise, whether it's tax, whether it's accounting, sales, um, cryptocurrency, you name it. I will dive into some topic of really good importance to help you get what you need as a successful entrepreneur. All of that is only $55 a month as a member of the Successful Entrepreneur Online Learning Community. So you want to join? Let's do this. You can try it free for 30 days. If you don't like it, cancel. We'll get your, give your money back. It's go to the realjasonduncan.com slash TSE. That stands for the Successful Entrepreneur. The realjasonduncan.com slash TSE. Join up and you can get access to coaching, the best investment in coaching dollar for dollar that you'll ever get anywhere. All right, tune in again next week when here on The Root of All Success, I will interview yet another amazingly successful entrepreneur about his or her journey, how they became successful, and what their keys of success were. Until then, remember, I'm the real Jason Duncan, and Jesus is King. Thank you for listening to another edition of The Root of All Success with the real Jason Duncan. If you've enjoyed this week's episode, we invite you to visit therootofallsuccess.com to access the show notes and other helpful resources. Take charge of your business. Grow it from great to incredible. Join us again next time here on The Root of All Success. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.